Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come, Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And we're really excited to be here today. We're going to talk about 1 Nephi 16 through 22. There's so much in here, Bryce. That's right. It's almost like we pushed the pause button in 1 through 7. Let's pause and talk about this wonderful vision of the tree of life. And now we're coming back and unpausing and continuing that journey to America. So let me jump in by reminding you that one of the great messages of 1 Nephi is the doctrine that how we respond to our trials shapes our character. In 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1, looking back on his life, Nephi recognizes that three main things shaped his character. He says his family, the teachings of his parents, his father, his adversity, and the things of God. And I guess I would guess that each one of us could say the same thing, that the things that have had the most impact on our lives are our family, the trials that we've had, and the things of God. So let's focus on trials. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to make the assumption that at some point, Nephi and Laman are kind of on the same spiritual level. Maybe that was never the case, but at least it, they were close. At least they were when boys, they started out kind of at that same innocent level. By the end of first Nephi, they're going to be very, very different men. Not because they went through different trials. But because the attitudes they had, the the attitude they met each trial with was different. And so I think one of the great messages the Lord starts the Book of Mormon with is, it's not the trial you go through, it's the response to the trial that shapes our character. So in 1 through 7, we tackled three challenges, leaving Jerusalem, going back for the plates, and then going back to pick up Ishmael and his family. And now we're going to tackle four in this podcast. How does Nephi respond? And how does Nephi show growth because of that response? And then we're going to say, how does Laman respond? And how does Laman show that he's falling? And the way we're going to measure Laman's fall is by the size of the rod that God has to get down to smack him with to get him to do what he needs to do. Now, Bryce, before we get into that, what would you say in this section are the big trials that these guys are going through? Okay, so in today's podcast, we're going to do the breaking of the bow and hunger. The the hunger has a way of afflicting us and getting our attention. And then Ishmael's going to die. So breaking of the bow, Ishmael's death. And then in chapter 17, we'll do the building of the boat. That's a challenge that they go through. And then chapter 18, the crossing of the sea. And each time we saw that Nephi responded a certain way and Laman responded a certain way. And we began to see Nephi growing. When Nephi didn't want to leave Jerusalem, but he turned to the Lord and had his heart softened, that chapter, the Lord picks him as the leader. You're going to lead this group. But Laman and Lemuel murmured. And the the rod that Heavenly Father had to get down to get them to leave Jerusalem was a good chewing out by their father. Now, that won't work when they're on the boat. They're much colder by the time they get to the boat. But that initial rod worked. He tapped them with that rod, and they, they left Jerusalem. And then to go back and get the plates, you can kind of see how Laman is falling because he beats his brother. He actually starts hitting and beating his brother. So what's the rod that the Lord gets down to get him to stop beating their brother and to get the plates and then come back? Shows up with an angel. An angel. Yeah. So he goes from a lecture from a prophet to an angel. And then in the next trial with the women, it's the tears of a woman that get Laman and Lemuel on board and get them to come back into the wilderness and bring Ishmael's family. But notice that the tears of a woman won't work on the boat when Nephi's wife cries out to them for mercy because they're much colder. Do you see how that shows how far they've fallen by the size of the rod that God has to get down to smack him with to get him to do what he needs to do? So now let's jump to 16, because this is everyday life, typical reactions in trial. So first of all, they wake up and there's the Liahona, and it's going to guide them as long as they have faith. And then Nephi breaks his bow, his steel bow, and because of it, they don't eat. And hunger is a, is a major trial, and they get hungry. And it's so bad that even Lehi murmurs. That's how bad it is. That's how hungry they are. Focus on Nephi's response. 
So this is every family that's headed out on vacation and they get a flat tire just as they pull out of town. This is, it's prom day, my date's on her way, and I just burned my forehead with my curling iron. Not to trivialize those, but this is everyday challenges, and notice how Nephi responds. This is living the gospel on a daily basis. The way we increase our spirituality is when trial comes. How does Nephi respond, Mike? He breaks his bow, and what's his response? He makes a new bow. I'll just deal with it. I'll just make a new one. Instead of freaking out and panicking and getting angry and getting upset, he just focuses on solving the problem. He doesn't see it as disfavor from God. He doesn't murmur, why is God doing this to me? He just simply sees it as an opportunity to solve a problem. I also think this reveals who Jesus is. It does. And I really think this is Nephi, and he's showing us how God is, because Nephi is doing everything right, and yet these horrible things are happening. And I think sometimes in our modern world, we have this tendency to think, well, if I'm righteous, if I pay my tithing, everything's going to work out. And broken bones. Wait, I got laid off. Yeah. And so this is a great story that we can apply today, right? Yep. And I just that's such a beautiful description about the balance between life is going to throw broken bows at you to see how you respond. And the way we respond is, okay, Lord, I have a broken bow. I'm going to fix it. But I can't do everything. So I'm going to do all I can do to fix my bow. Would you help me with the rest? Can you point? Yeah. Can you tell me where to go to hunt? I'll fix the, my bow. And I just love that beautiful. beautiful balance in terms of every day living the gospel. Because every day, you know, no matter how righteous we are, you're going to wake up to a broken bow once in a while. And there's no need to whine and complain. Just make a new one. Just solve the problem. I love verse 29. Look at the end where it says, we can see that by small means, the Lord can bring about great things. Maybe it's just a small thing. I love the story by President Packer about the guy whose business was failing, and he prayed and prayed and prayed, and the Lord inspired him, get up early. So he'd get up early and go to the office. And it's a beautiful story where over time, he made small changes that just changed everything, and the business flourished. And so sometimes it's just the little things, isn't it? Yeah, it's just make a new ball. Yeah. Just make a new ball. Oh, well, there's no steel to make a steel ball? Well, I'll make a wood one. I can improvise. Yeah. Now, let's contrast that with the next trial. Now, we'll come back to the rod in just a moment, but let's contrast those attitudes because I want to show you those attitudes back to back. So the next trial is verse 34 where Ishmael dies. The daughters really, really have a hard time with the death of their dad, and I can understand that. But notice what they do, and this is I'll admit I'm guilty. I think we're all a little bit guilty. But what a contrast to Nephi just saying, oh, my bow is broken. I'm going to make a new one, to watching what the daughters of Ishmael do when their dad dies. So notice that the current trial is the death of their father. Now, let me read verse 35. It came to pass that the daughters of Ishmael did mourn exceedingly because of the loss of their father. Now, that's today's trial. Their dad died. But notice what they do next. And because of their afflictions in the wilderness. So do you see what we often do? We add to today's trial the memory of yesterday's trial. Yeah, we we dig up everything that ever went bad in the past. So because I'm having a bad day today, it reminds me of all the bad days I've ever had. Now, the weight of that is getting pretty heavy on my shoulders. Today's trial is that their dad has died, but they add to today's trial the afflictions that they went through the wilderness. Now watch what they do next. And they did murmur against my father because he had brought them out of the land of Jerusalem, saying, our father is dead. That's today's trial. Yea, and we have wandered much in the wilderness, and we have suffered much affliction, hunger, thirst, and fatigue. That's yesterday's trial. Now notice what they do next. And after all these sufferings, we must yet perish in the wilderness with hunger. They're already adding tomorrow's trial to yesterday and today's trial. And it hasn't even happened. It hasn't even happened yet, but they're anticipating. Why even try? Everything's going to go wrong. Yeah. So, you know, your, your family's on vacation. You're all excited. You've had some rough times getting ready. And then just as you pull out for vacation, boom, you get a flat tire. And this is when we often say, oh, what? why even try? 
it's not even worth it. Everything's going to go wrong in this trip. So because I have a flat tire today, we look back to every trial we've had in the past, and that weighs on our shoulders, and then we anticipate everything going wrong in the future, and with that much weight on your shoulders, verse 36, what do they want to do? What do we often want to do? I'm giving up. I'm giving up. Let's just stay home. I'm not even going to go to the prom. Everything's going wrong. Call him and tell him I'm not, I don't want to go. Bryce, I, I associate a lot with the 18 to 30 crowd, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard stories where a young man or young woman will say, I don't even see what the point of dating is. And I say, why? And they're like, they're all the same. Yeah, because I've, I currently have a bad experience. Yeah. I remember every bad experience I've ever had, and I anticipate having nothing but bad experiences in the future. And the irony is both the men and women are saying this, that's and right. I'm always like, no, men are not bad, or no, women are great. They're not bad. Anyway, so that's- You see that uh, attitude? Yeah, yeah. It's just that attitude. Now, now, contrast those two attitudes with your life. Are you more like a Nephi where you just build another bow? You just, you tackle the problem. Oh, we were going to have a big family picnic and now it's raining. So instead of throwing up our arms and giving up, we just solve the problem. And notice verse 37, the point where they're so ticked and dad's dead. Laman said to Lemuel and also to the sons of Ishmael, behold, let's kill dad. Yeah. So your dad's dead. My solution is let's slay our father. So I think that's a little different than quitting. It's like, I'm going to burn it to the ground. And I, I, this whole journey, this whole attempt, everything that we're doing here, you know what? Not only are we going back to Jerusalem, but we're going to, we're going to destroy our father. Yeah. And, and so I think quitting is one thing, but then, man, I, I've met people that are just, they, they're going through this and maybe you've had this experience where you've had this trial and you're just like, well, I just give up. Yeah. And I love one thing that happened. We, we had this, um, we had a meeting with um, Elder Bednar, and we were talking about the trials that the youth are facing. And the question was, what do we do? How do we help people that are struggling with pornography? And I love what Elder Bednar said. He says, well, what's the alternative? The only answer is to keep fighting. Are you going to quit? Are you, are you just going to give up? You don't quit. And I think that's such a beautiful, I mean, it took him two seconds to say such a deep thing. And I think that is something that we should emphasize as we read this is the alternative is is awful. Don't burn it down. Just keep fighting. If you go back to Jerusalem, Layman, you will die in the Babylonian sieges. Yeah. You will die when the Babylonians come in. This is hard. I get it. Yeah. But it's so much better than the alternative. Keep fighting. I just think that's a beautiful insight. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the broken bow, what gets Laman and Lemuel on board? How do they help out? What do they do that kind of gets them to shake? Look at verse 27. This is a pretty big rod. We don't know what the message on the Leohona was, but suddenly there was a message on the Leohona that shook them. I'll tell you, sometimes I've had moments where I'm in a bad state and I the spirit convicts me of something and it just gets me. Right. And I or, think something happened like that. Right. Or, yeah, something like that. They opened up and it's like opening up and seeing a scripture and it slaps you in the yeah, face. Yeah, yeah. Something was written on the side of the Leahona that really shook them. So let's do the next rod. When Ishmael dies, what's the rod? Well, what's evidence that Laman is falling? Is, is 37 is great evidence about Laman is now they're going to kill their dad. They've contemplated killing Nephi. They've left him to die in the wilderness, but now they're actually going to kill their father, the old man. What's the rod that the Lord pulls down and prevents them? Verse 39. I'd love to know more about this. So would I. But they hear a voice from heaven. I don't think it was the still small voice whispering into their souls. I think they literally heard a voice shaking from the heaven saying, don't you dare do this. And that shook them. So look at the rods that he's pulled down. Leaving Jerusalem, the rod was a stern rebuke from Lehi. And then the plates, the rod was an angel. And then with Ishmael and his daughters and bringing them back to the wilderness, the rod was the tears of a woman. That's very hard for men to resist is the tears and pleadings of a crying woman. And then now with a broken bow, something written on the side of the Leohona. And now the actual voice of God coming from the heavens and shaking them. Do you see how each rod is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? It's because Laman is getting colder and colder and colder. And the reason for that is he always responds by murmuring. 
he always responds negatively. And I think one of the great lessons we need to take out of First Nephi is if you're going to respond like Laman, that's the direction you're going spiritually. But Nephi, every time he responds, every time, it's first he says, I'll go and do because the Lord will help us. I know that the Lord giveth no commandment, save he shall prepare a way for them. I'm going to do it. And then with Lehi's daughters, he's rebuking them with the scriptures. He's clearly a man growing in the spirit. And now here's all of a sudden, this is a man who is growing spiritually as Laman and Lemuel are shrinking in their spirituality. So you begin to see the message. So I know, Mike, you've got a lot of things to point out in chapter 16 before we move on to 17. Why don't you tell us more about the Leahona and what you see in chapter 16? A couple things that I think are relevant here is the idea that Nephi is constructing this narrative later. It's a long time later when he's writing this. And so I think what what's going on here is he's talking about a couple things that are relevant to his people. And one of these is the right to rule. I think he's really trying to communicate that message that uh, he and his successors are the ones who have the right to rule. And so part of that has to do with kingship. And so you see some of this in the text. So for example, in the 16th chapter, we read in the middle of verse 38, where Laman and Lemuel complain, and they say, he's led us away, and he's thought to make himself a king and a ruler over us, that he may do with us according to his will and pleasure. So... Nephi's writing that Laman and Lemuel, one of their contentions is that Nephi wants to be king, which I I think is interesting. Why are we talking about being a king when there's just a few of these people here that are in Saudi Arabia? Well, I think what's going on is later, many years later, when Nephi constructs this narrative, uh, he is in the Americas where there's indigenous people, and these indigenous people see Nephi and the technology that they have, and you know, this is my extrapolating from the text, but I think what's happening is Nephi and his technology and their understanding of God puts them to the place where they could be uh, in a position of power. And so Nephi does become a king. We read this later when we get to second Nephi. Now, there's some stuff happening here with the text, and I think what Nephi is doing is he's constructing a narrative to show his listeners that are ancient that he's to be the legitimate king and that he's to have the right to the throne. In ancient Israel, The king was the one that conducted the fall festival, the Feast of Tabernacles festival, where everybody every year would come in uh, from Israel and people that were not Israel were invited to come into the temple. And it was an eight day ceremony and they celebrated kingship and God's right to rule over the people. And the king and queen would be enthroned in front of everyone and they would make covenants to God. And then the people would thereby make covenants vicariously through the king and queen. And the king and queen would be enthroned, and all the people, as they made covenants, would become kings and queens uh, in the sense that they were also covenant sons and daughters of God. And we read some of this in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, where God says, I want to make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And whenever I teach this, I always say a kingdom of kings and queens, priests and priestesses, male and female. There is no kingdom without the queen. You've got to have both. And so when this happened every year in the fall festival in the first temple before the temple was destroyed, which Nephi and Lehi would have, would have been aware of, when this happened, the king would have the accruements of kingship. He would have the, the gadgets, the things that were associated with becoming and being king, whose right it is to rule, to represent Yahweh on the earth. And so some of the things that they had, we could read this in the Bible. We can read... For example, that the Israelites had the Ark of the Covenant, and this is all over in the Psalms. And I'm writing a paper on this that I'll post. It's it's a it's a work in progress, so this is not the final form, but I'll post this in the show notes. But the Israelites led a procession with the Ark of the Covenant, and it was like a journey, and they would proceed, and they would sing songs. And in the Ark was the Urim and Thummim, and the breastplate. And stone tablets. I like to refer to them as the tablets of destiny. If you read ancient Near Eastern literature, the king would always have those. And in the ark was Aaron's rod. And so the question is, well, what kind of things did Nephi and his successors have? And they had the Nephite equivalent of these things. For example, they had the Urim and Thummim. They had the breastplate. Now, they had the sword of Laban. And the question is, well, what was the sword that would be the equivalent in Israelite 
uh, temple theology, and it was the sword of Goliath. You can read in the text that the sword of Goliath was associated with and in connection to the Holy of Holies. And the stone tablets, well, the equivalency would be the brass plates that Nephi had. And then finally, uh, what, what what is the connection between Aaron's rod and the Liahona? And I think there's one connection that is significant. The Liahona provided bread, provided food. It says in verse 16, it came to pass as my father arose in the morning and went forth to the tent door to his great astonishment, he beheld upon the ground a round ball of curious workmanship. And we read in the Exodus narrative, in the morning, the dew lay round about the host, and when the dew was gone up, behold, upon the ground, upon the face of the ground, lay a small round thing. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, it is manna. By the way, that's a pun, manna, man who, it literally means, I don't know what it is. And so they called it manna, for they wist not what it was. So if you do a little textual searching here on the manna and the liahona, there's a specific narrative pattern that Nephi is trying to do. In other words, my contention is he's establishing the Liahona as the equivalency of either Aaron's rod or the pot of manna that was in the ark. You have a really good distinction, a really good clear picture to see that there is a distinction between the Israelite covenant ark and the Nephite, I'm going to call it the ark, but they are equivalencies. So you've got the Urim and Thummim in both places. You've got the breastplate in both, the sword. You've got the tablets. And you've got either Aaron's rod or the pot of manna and the Liahona. And this isn't something that I've come up with. This is a, a great scholar by the name of Don Bradley has written an article on this, and we'll post this as well. Now, is any of this really relevant in the classroom? I think maybe if you were a teacher, you could just kind of say, hey, this is Nephi showing you who it is to be king. But I think he's also showing that there's signs when God's with you. And I think a big picture on this whole book of First Nephi is Nephi is trying to give us listeners, hey, do you want to know if God's with you? How do you respond to trials? How do you respond when bad things happen? And how do you feel when you approach these bad things and you go to the Lord? And so like big picture stuff, little picture stuff, however you want to approach this. I don't know if in a classroom you get too much into this, but I think it's kind of cool to well, talk about. And we all have our own liahonas. We all have our own, you know, pot of manna and rod that budded. We all have our own manifestation that God is with us. It doesn't necessarily have to be this level. I don't need to receive a Urim and Thummim yeah. to know that God is with me. But, you know, I can I can have trials and I can have the Lord respond to me in, in my ways and with my small miracles and know that these same things are evidence that God is with me. And so I think it's it's wonderful to see the Lord dealing with a group of people who are having everyday challenges and then look at my life and say, oh my goodness, he has sent me a Leahona and he has done these very things in my life. I have evidence that he is with me. So I think that's a great way, a great connection to make, Mike. Isn't it Alma 37, Bryce, where the connection is made? Hey, just like the Leahona, we have the word of God. Yeah. Look to God and live. The simpleness of the way. Yep. So good. Yep. Anyway, so that's a little bit on the Liahona. Now, this is totally way out in the weeds of geeking out, but a, a really great scholar that I love, his name is Mark Smith, and he's written some really great books. He's written Where the Gods Are, or The Origins of Biblical Monotheism. Wonderful scholar. It's clear in the ancient Near East that there was a belief in multiple divine beings, that there were female and male deities. And there were levels of deities. And so the top level would be the father and mother deity. And they had different names, but El Elyon would be the most high God. The next level would be the divine son. This is Yahweh. Then there would be another level of divine beings, the angels, the Malachim. They were messengers between the gods and men. And there's a fourth level he writes about in his book. And I remember reading this going, oh my gosh, Bryce, this is the Book of Mormon. He wrote his dissertation on this. I have it because, yes, I am a nerd. And he wrote 500 pages about the fourth level of deities. And they're the gadget makers. And can you imagine writing a 500-page dissertation on a gadget maker in the heavens in the ancient Near East? And his name was Kothar Wahasis. I just like to call him Kothar. And he was the gadget maker. And he made cool stuff like weapons for the gods. And anyway, so as I'm reading some of this stuff, because, yes, I have no life and I'm a nerd, 
What am I thinking about? Leah Hanna. Yeah. Okay, sorry. That was way nerdy. I apologize. That's two minutes of your life you'll never get back. So anyway, let's get back to normalcy. All right, let's jump to <laughs> chapter 17. So let's get do our next trial. Again, we're going to watch Nephi respond and Laman respond. We're going to watch what happens to Nephi because of his response and the same thing. And we're going to watch this man just grow. I love chapter 13, 17 because you begin to see a very, very different attitude emerging. Let's look at Nephi's attitude toward his trials. Let me read the first three verses, the end of verse one. And we did travel and wade through much affliction in the wilderness, and our women did bear children in the wilderness. And so great were the blessings of the Lord upon us that while we did live upon raw meat in the wilderness, our women did give plenty of suck for their children and were strong, even like unto the men. And they began to bear their journeyings without murmurings. And thus we see that the commandments of God must be fulfilled. And if it so be that the children of men keep the commandments of God, he doth nourish them and strengthen them and provide means whereby they can accomplish the thing which he commanded them. Therefore, he did provide means for us while we did journey in the sojourn in the wilderness. Do you see that attitude? Yeah, it's been hard. We've had some trials, but look at the blessings we've received. Look at what God has done for us and with us. And if everything's easy, we don't need deliverance. So I think that's part of the process. So now contrast that to the to layman's attitude. It's like, are you two really going through the same trial? It's almost funny here. So starting in verse oh, 19, it came to pass that I, Nephi, was exceedingly sorrowful because of the hardness of their hearts. And now when they saw that I began to sorrow, they were glad and they began to rebuke him. Now listen to what they say, starting in verse 20. And thou art like unto our father, led away by the foolish imaginations of his heart. And he hath led us out of the land of Jerusalem. And we have wandered in the wilderness these many years, and our women have toiled, being big with child, and they have borne children in the wilderness, and suffered all things, save it were death. And it would have been better that they had died before they came out of Jerusalem than to have suffered these afflictions. Behold, these many years we've suffered in the wilderness, which time we might have enjoyed our possessions and the land of our inheritance, and we might have been happy. Oh my goodness, could there be a bigger contrast between two brothers. Because what don't they get? What do They think they would be happy if they're in Jerusalem, but what's the irony here? Um, you'd be dead pretty soon. You've got an army coming into Jerusalem to destroy you. But it's so funny. Nephi looks back and says, yes, we had trials and our women were strong and they handled the trials and they were great. And so wonderful were the blessings that we've survived and we've been happy. And yet you've got this other brother going through the exact same trials saying it was so bad, we might as well have been dead. Our women, I can't believe they had to give birth in those circumstances. They should have just died before having to do so. Do you see the attitude? Now, is there any wonder why Nephi is growing spiritually and Laman is losing light? In this very chapter, Nephi will say to him, you are past feeling. You cannot feel his words. And yet Nephi is growing so in tune to the Spirit. And so when they won't help him, this is just just to show the beautiful power of Nephi. I love where he just simply says, first he rebukes them with the scriptures and gives them all these wonderful messages. Um, Verse 47, I am full of the spirit of God. You contrast that with 45, you are past feeling. I am full of the spirit of the God. Therefore, my frame has no strength. And they were angry with me and were desirous to throw me into the depths. I'm reading verse 48 depths of the sea. So now they're actually going to kill him. By the way, I think they're throwing him off a cliff. I don't think I could wade Nephi out and kind of drag him out. You know, when we were brothers as kids, remember, and you'd kind of tackle your brother in the pool and you'd throw him down. That's not what we're talking about. No, they're going to kill him. Yeah. And I spake unto them saying, I love this. This is Nephi growing in spiritual power. In the name of the almighty God, I command you that you touch me not. For I am filled with the power of God, even unto the consuming of my flesh, and whoso shall lay his hands upon me shall wither as a dried reed, and he shall be as naught before the power of God, for God shall smite him. Look at the power that this man has, the confidence in God. I love verse 50. If God had commanded me to do all things, I could do them. If he should command me that I should say to this water, be thou earth, it should be earth. And if I should say it, it would be done. So Laman is a murderer, at least in his heart he is. And Nephi is exercising tremendous spiritual power. These are the same two boys that left Jerusalem relatively on the same spiritual plane. 
how you respond to your trials will shape your character. Do you look back and say, yeah, I had some trials, but man, did the Lord bless me and he gave me help and I made it through and it was a great experience in the end. Or do you look at your trials like Laman and say, that was so bad, I should have died. We should have given up. Well, I think there's something else here too, Bryce, the way they view commandments. And I think this is relevant to a Latter-day Saint audience. So look at verse 22. And they say, no, we're we're the righteous ones, Nephi. And why do they say they're righteous? Because we keep the statutes and judgments of the Lord. I think they're Deuteronomists. I think they look at the law and the, all the intricacies of it. And they're like, um, Nephi, we're doing that. We're righteous. And this, to me, comes to a point of a distinction. And I'm going to geek out on just this one word in Greek. Um, and it's decline differently, but it's the same word. And it's John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And the word keep is basically tereo, which is to stand like a watchman or to be awake. Like if, if it's your watch and you're to watch at the wall, you're to watch in case there's an enemy. And so this is how I read John 14, 15. I read it as, if you love me, the Lord is saying, be awake and watch stand at the ready think of a keep what is a keep it's a it's like a stronghold are you watching and to me the distinction is powerful every time the lord prompts nephi nephi's tereo he is at the ready he's watching and he's doing it i don't think nephi cares about all 613 specific laws of torah that are in there now are all 613 codified by the time nephi leaves i have no idea but i don't think nephi cares about the intricacies of the law as much as he does about listening to the voice of god and laman and lemuel are like no we think it's a checklist and i'm doing the checklist now this is where i think bryce we get into relevance what's more important we sometimes, as Latter-day Saints, we want a checklist from the prophet. Listen to this music. Here's I, how you repent. First step, second yeah, step, third step. Give me the steps of repentance. Give me the steps of revelation. And just recently, Elder Benar talked to us, and he said, no, revelation, you have the gift of the Holy Ghost. You're in the river. Stay in the river. And it's this constant flow. And so I like that. And I think even the understanding of what the commandments are. I think Laman and Lemuel have a radically different view than Nephi. And so I think that's important. And I think it's relevant to us because I really attitude. do think sometimes we want a checklist because yeah. it's, it's easier. It's attitude. It all yeah. comes down to attitude. Anyway, One of my most favorite quotations from Ezra Taft Benson is this, when obedience ceases to be an irritant and becomes our quest, in that moment, God will endow us with power. I'm going to read that again. I just think that's powerful. When obedience ceases to be an irritant and becomes our quest, in that moment, God will endow us with power. I think that's the attitude here. How do you see trial? How do you see commandments? How do you see the, the request to build a boat and cross the ocean and leave Jerusalem? You can't see greater contrast than you do between Nephi and Laman. They're just radically different. and It's like they get to the point where they can't even talk to each other. Yeah. So what's the, what's the rod that the Lord has to pull down to get them to build the boat? So Nephi has said, touch me not, and they feel that power. And so they don't dare touch him for quite a while. They don't dare touch him. And the Lord says, no, reach out your hand and touch him. This is kind of funny here. Reach out your hand and touch him. I won't destroy him. I'll just shock him. So Nephi kind of chases them and touches them, and they get a nice zap. What verse is that? That's 52, 53, and 54. Okay. Stretch forth your hands in verse 53. I won't destroy them, but I'll shock them. And I love verse 54 because I can just picture Nephi coming at him and they t I tell it the other way and he's chasing them down. And it came to pass that I stretched forth my hand unto my brethren and they did not wither before me, but the Lord did shake them. And then verse 55, we know of a surety that the Lord is with thee, for we know that it is the power of the Lord that has shaken us. It took a literal zap of power to get them to obey. Now, initially, they left Jerusalem because their dad chewed them out. And now it takes a literal zap of power from God to get them to build this boat. The more you respond the way that Laman responds, the colder you get and the more he has to pound you with that rod to get you to do the, do the very things that are going to save your life, the very things that are in your best interest, but we're not listening to them. And yet Nephi, who needs the rod the least, is the most sensitive to it. 
Oh, there's one thing I did want to point out. I wanted to point out Nephi's response to a very difficult commandment. Nephi has no idea how to build a boat. He's never built a boat. That's completely out of his realm of thinking. And so how does he respond? Well, Nephi knows he needs to build tools. And that I know how to do. I can melt tools. So tell me where the ore is, and I'll start building the tools. And I love that response is, when you get a difficult task from God, don't focus on what you can't do. Focus on what you can do. How can you handle the trial? And the Lord will help you with the things that you can't do. What verse is that in where he says, tell me where to get ore? Well, is that verse, verse 9 and 10? Yeah. Verse 9, he says, Lord, whither shall I go that I may find ore to molten that I may make tools to construct my ship? Not, how do I build a ship? I don't know how to build a ship. I need tools. So let me focus on what I can do. Let me focus on what is within my realm of change. And let me focus on that, and then you help me. And then as an insight, you go to chapter 18, verse 1. The Lord did show me from time to time after what manner I should work the timbers of the ship. So I'll do what I can do, and then the Lord will help me with what I can't do. I just really like that. I I think he constructs the narrative in a pattern that is indicative and is reflecting the creation of the world and the creation of the tabernacle and the creation and the flood narrative. And there's a great literature on this. One of my favorites is John Levinson's written some stuff on this. And another um, great non-LES scholar, his name is John Walton. He's written a ton of really good books uh, about the flood narrative and about the creation epic. One of them is called The Lost World of Genesis 1. And I really like it. And what, what Walton's trying to show us is that the ancients viewed the creation of the world in temple themes. And so you have the work declared good, you have a completion formula, you have a blessing pronounced, and then with that, in connection with it, is the command to multiply and fill the earth. And we read that in the creation narrative, we read that in the tabernacle narrative and the flood narrative. And then you have this idea of the of it being curious workmanship, that it's a specific, patterned after the heavens way to do it. And typically with these, there's a mountain theophany. In other words, this time where you're instructed by God. And so Nephi, when he talks about the ship, he's showing his listeners, hey, just like the tabernacle was built, I'm building this. Just like God formed the heavens and made the earth, I'm doing this. Ginsburg, Lewis Ginsburg's written a lot about this, about how when we read the creation narrative, we need to see the temple. And when we see the temple, we need to see the creation. And Lewis Ginsburg is not LDS. All the biblical scholars, you start getting into the weeds of the temple and the creation and the flood and Moses and the tabernacle, and they're intricately linked from a narrative standpoint. And Nephi is doing this. And I think he's doing this because I think Nephi is patterning his scripture after the scripture that he already has. And look what he says. It's this little phrase. So it's 1 Nephi 19, verse 6. In the 19th chapter, he's talking all about, hey, this is what I'm doing, and I'm making these plates. But then look what he says in verse 6 of chapter 19. He says, nevertheless, I do not write anything upon plates, save it be that which is sacred. And now if I do err, even did they err of old. Not that I would excuse myself because of other men, but because of the weakness which is in me. I think that line in there where he says, if I err, even did they err of old. I think Nephi is giving us a hint about what he's doing. And I think what he's saying is, I've never written scripture before, but I have the brass plates. So I'm going to pattern my narrative after the narrative of the ancients. And so what do the ancients do? Well, they use these archetypes to talk about creation and flood, and they do the hero's journey. And the hero's journey, you know, is where an individual is required to leave home, do a difficult mission, go through extreme opposition and be victorious and establish peace. And once they return home and they know evil's been put down and order's restored, a lot of times in these heroes' journey, we have a house built or a temple to the God, and there's peace. Um, and it's pretty much every Disney movie ever. Now, how could Joseph Smith know that, Mike? How could Joseph Smith possibly know to pattern the Book of Mormon to match that same pattern that we're discovering now in scholarship? It's amazing. It's just a testimony to the brilliance of the Lord and the fact that Joseph Smith didn't do this, that this he was a translator, not a creator here. I just love how Nephi is like, hey, if you guys don't like how I'm writing this, because I've met people that are like, I hate Nephi. 
I'm like, why do you hate Nephi? And how like, could you hate Nephi? Because he's just bragging about himself and he's talking about how cool he is and his brother is so lame. And I'm like, okay, but look at it as a hero's journey. Look at it as a seventh century text. And that's what they're all doing. Read Exodus. Moses Compare is doing the same Compare it to other stuff. scriptures. Yeah. Anyway, so we can't read it like it's a modern literary text. We have to look at it like... What's Nephi doing? And I think he's doing this on purpose and he's telling us. Anyway, I just, I love 1 Nephi 19.6 and I think it's cool. So let's jump back to chapter 18 and we'll do the final, you know, trial that I think this, cha- the, the first Nephi talks about. And that's the journey across the water. So as they're traveling, they, they build the ship, they get the ship completed, they do help their brother. And as they're journeying across the sea to the promised land, they start to get merry and they start to dance and to sing. And they begin to speak with much rudeness in verse 9 of chapter 18. And they did forget by what power they had been brought thither. And they were lifted up unto exceeding rudeness. So their old selves come out. And then when Nephi kind of rebukes them, they get angry. We will not that our younger brother should be ruler over us. Verse 11, they take him and they bind him. They bind him with cords and they treated him with much harshness. Knowing that they've already tried to kill him, they've already, you know, beating him was something they did long ago. I can't imagine what they are doing to this man. So the Lord t- takes down the big stick. And this is the last of his sticks. He doesn't have a bigger stick th- than this one. And that is verse 13. He threatens them with death with absolute death and destruction. And notice what didn't work. Lehi pleading for Nephi didn't work. The tears of Nephi's wife didn't work. Um, Nothing works. The only stick that the Lord has left is to threaten them with physical destruction. Verse 20, nothing save it were the power of God, which threatened them with destruction could soften their hearts. And so the Lord gets out the biggest stick he possibly can, and they finally loose Nephi. They free him. Now, again, what kind of man is Nephi becoming? Verse 21, after they had loosed me, I took the compass, and it did work. And it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord, and after I prayed, the wind ceased, and the storm did cease, and there was great calm. Nephi calms the sea. Just like the master he worshipped would later calm the sea. He has become a type of Christ. He has become a man of Christ. Now, this is the same boy that didn't want to leave Jerusalem and prayed that his heart would be softened. And now he's calming the sea. He's a hero now. He's a hero. Yeah. And may I suggest, may I just bear my witness that one of the great lessons of First Nephi is how you respond to trial shapes your character. If you respond like Nephi, if you just build another bow, if you say, Lord, I don't know how to do this, but I know I need tools. Can you help me with what I don't know? If you say, I will go and do, for the Lord will make it possible. If you have the attitude that Nephi had, whatever the trial you face, if you will face them with the attitude that Nephi had, you will receive the spiritual help and grow spiritually like he did. This man has become a man of God. And I just, I love the contrast that never did two brothers become more different than Nephi and Laman, and yet they went through the exact same trials. It's not the trial. It's how we respond. So they land, they come to the new place, they cross the the waters. Once again, we're back to the ancient view of this. Crossing waters was a symbol for going to a new realm. The ancients believed that there were waters above the earth. If you've listened to some of our podcasts we've done with Revelation, Psalm 29, the conception was that God was above the waters, that above the earth, there was this dome called the Rakia, and above that, there were the floods and the waters, and above that, there was God. And so Nephi crossing the waters is an ascension, which is, sounds so strange to us in the West. But what Nephi is saying is, I've ascended, I'm like unto a son of God. And then with that, Part of the first temple in Israelite tradition was, why do we do this? For fertility. The water ceremony. They would take the water and they would pour it over the altar from the spring of Gihon. And they'd pour the water on and the water would go and trickle back into the spring. And it's the cycle. So look at the very end of 1 Nephi 18, 24 and 25. Those verses are fertility verses. Why? Because God is 
the bread. He is the water. John's writing the same kind of stuff. He's just doing it differently. But John's casting this in first temple literature as well. So we have the fertility. Then we have the plate narrative in the 19th chapter. Bryce, should we talk about large and small and kind of what's going on there with this just briefly? Do yeah. you want to mention that? So here the Lord says, make another set of plates. So look in chapter 19, all of the these and those, these and those. He's really distinguishing between two sets of plates. Make these plates, make those plates, make these plates. So Nephi's making a second set of plates, which are very identical, but they contain a more spiritual version. He's got a full version that contains the history and the spiritual. Then he's got a second set that contains the spiritual. And then back in First Nephi chapter 9, Nephi says, I have no idea why I'm doing this. I don't know. I have no idea. So fast forward several years, Mormon, as he starts to assemble the gold plates, he's using the large plates of Nephi to abridge. He's abridging from First Nephi down through, you know, from Lehi down to Benjamin. And those were the large plates in Mormon's word. So Mormon's writing it. And then Mormon says, look, after I did this, I really, really like these small plates, which are Nephi's words. They're not my words. They're Nephi's words. I'm going to throw them in just as they are. Unedited. And I don't know why. This is words of Mormon, verse 7. I don't know why I'm throwing them in. But the whispering in the Spirit says that I should. I think this is one of the great evidences of trusting Heavenly Father and trusting that if you will follow His commandments, He will have everything ready. He will cross every T and dot every I when it needs to be done. So Nephi wrote a second set of plates, not knowing why he should. Mormon threw that second set of plates in right after, well, I'm not saying where they were, but after he had abridged the same time period, he throws in the same material, but in Nephi's words instead of his words, and he doesn't understand why. Well, fast forward 2,600 some odd years after Nephi was commanded to make the second set of plates, and Martin Harris loses 116 pages of the translation, which was Mormon's abridgment of Lehi down to Benjamin. And the enemy that stole them, Satan's plan was to alter them, and then if he retranslates them, it won't match what they have, and then they'll prove that Joseph Smith was a fraud, he wasn't a prophet, he couldn't produce the same material. And the Lord just simply says, Joseph, I got you covered. I got a second set. And they're not the same words. It's not Mormon's point of view. It's Nephi telling his own story and Jacob. So throw the second set of plates in, and it will recover what was lost in the 116 pages. So the Lord knew that Martin Harris would lose the 116 pages 2,600 years in advance and told Nephi, make another set of plates and include the spiritual. And then he told Mormon, throw those on the gold plates. Now that's a God that we can trust. When Nephi goes back for the women, if you count the number of single men that need spouses, there's five of them. Three of them are righteous, Nephi, Sam, and Zoram. They've picked up Zoram. Two of them are wicked, Laman and Lamuel. Now, how many single daughters does Ishmael have? If you go back and read in 1 Nephi chapter 7, he has five single daughters. He does have some married sons and that, that, that don't need a spouse. But Ishmael has five single daughters, and there are five single men in Lehi's, you know, traveling with Lehi because they've picked up Zoram. Now, how many righteous daughters does Ishmael have? Three. How many rebellious daughters does Ishmael have? Two. That's not a coincidence. But the point, Bryce, that you're making is they're matched up even with temperament. Yeah. Which I find fascinating. And so the Lord knows what he's doing. If he can tell Nephi 2,600 years in advance to make a second set of plates, then he can put the things in place in my life. He can make sure that I have the things that I need. He can help you find a spouse and, and help you cross paths. The Lord is in charge. I can almost see Nephi just shaking. He's just so passionate about these plain and precious things that were messed up and taken out of the text. And both times in 9 and in 19, he says, okay, I just explained what I'm doing. Now I want to put in 
what is jacked out of the Bible. And what does he talk about? It's all this redemptive Jesus. All Messiah. It's all who Jesus is. And I love the Book of Mormon showing us this. And this is Nephi's words. It says in verse 8 of the 19th chapter, He cometh according to the words of the angel in 600 years. Verse 9, The world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught, or a thing of nothing. Wherefore, they scourge him, and he suffereth it, and they smite him, and he suffereth it. And they spit upon him, and he suffereth it. Well, if he'll suffereth it, then we can learn something there. And then verse 10, I think this is the most footnoted in all of scripture that we have. And it says, the God of our fathers who were led out of Egypt and out of bondage, who were preserved in the wilderness by him, yea, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yieldeth himself according to the words of the angel as a man into the hands of wicked men, to be lifted up according to the words of Zenoch, and to be crucified according to the words of Neum, and to be buried in the sepulcher according to the words of Zenos, which he spake concerning the three days of darkness, which should be a sign given of his death unto those who should inhabit the isles of the sea, more especially given unto those who are of the house of Israel. Those three prophets, Zenic, Neum, and Zenos, are not anywhere in the Old Testament. My contention is those are northern prophets, part of what in scholarship is called the Elohist narrative. We don't know because we don't have their records. But to Nephi, he is putting in his record stuff that I believe that he says this got taken out. And so for the rest of the 19th chapter, he's talking about how he views Jesus. He's quoting Zenos. He's talking about how this Lord remembers those that are upon the isles of the sea, those that are in the chaos. Verse 18, I, Nephi, have written these things unto my people, that perhaps I might persuade them that they would remember the Lord, their Redeemer. I think that these plates, because they were carried up with the kings, uh, I believe that during the Feast of Tabernacles, everybody came and they were reminded who their real king was, who their heavenly king was. And to Nephi, in my opinion, this is a big deal. Nephi is really wanting to fix this. And to really drive the point home, he's going to quote off the brass plates two very important chapters out of Isaiah. He's going to quote the 48th chapter and the 49th chapter. And these are both associated with first temple Israelite religion. And big picture, Isaiah 48 and 49 is all temple. The congregation would come, they would receive the name, they would stand up, They would be called to come to the Lord, and in both chapters at the end was a promise of seed and fertility. I will put in the show notes some stuff, some outlines for you if you're interested in knowing more about this. Most of the scholarship on the Feast of Tabernacles, Bryce, which I find fascinating, is not LDS. The few LDS scholars that I found that have pulled this out, it's just fascinating. If there was one book I would suggest every reader, if you're interested in this, is a book called Who Shall Ascend to the Hill of the Lord by LeGrand Baker and Stephen Ricks. And the beauty of it is it's free. You can get it at Deseret Book, I think, but you can get it for free. So I'll post all of this. But that's big picture stuff. This is First Temple religion, and it's all about who the king is. And I want to point out why Nephi quotes it. Going back to chapter 19, he says, look, I could quote Moses. I could quote other prophets. And he has. He's quoted Zenos, and he'll quote Zenic. And I could quote other prophets. But the reason I'm going to quote Isaiah is because that I might more fully persuade my brethren and us, to believe in the Lord, our Redeemer. I'm going to quote Isaiah. His motive is, I need you to see Jesus. I need you to come to Jesus. Everything points to the temple, which points to the Savior. And this is a beautiful way to end First Nephi. I just love the ending of these Isaiah sections. Look at the end of the Isaiah 49 section in chapter 21, First Nephi. And it says in verse 25, it says, Thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. It's a promise of seed. I will feed them, verse 26. I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy mighty Savior and thy Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Now that's a little graphic right there at the end. And it has this hint of war and chaos. And verse 13 is kind of doing this too. 
Look what it says. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, for the feet of those who are in the east shall be established, and they shall break forth into singing, O mountains, and they shall be smitten no more. And the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. This is first temple religion. To have the person's feet established, and by the way, that's not in the Masoretic text. That's only on the brass plates. And I think one of the reasons why is because post-exile, this was edited out. There are no more kings after the exile. And since there are no more kings, the Feast of Tabernacles has changed. But before the exile, before the temple's destroyed, at the end of the ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles, this autumn festival, the king and queen would be enthroned in the Holy of Holies, and their feet would be established. They'd put their feet literally on the ark. It would become the footstool because the king and queen represented God. The king represented Yahweh before all men. The queen represented the mother deity, and they were the representatives of God. And as they made covenants with God, then they would turn to the audience and everyone would then become sons and daughters of God. They would make the same covenant and it was the extension of the king. As the king made covenants, so the people did, and everyone covenanted to be loyal to Yahweh. All this stuff's in the Psalms. And so to have your feet established means the king is enthroned and we are following Yahweh. He's our king. And so at the end, Yahweh or Jehovah. So at the end of First Nephi 21, we have seed. And at the end of First Nephi 20, we have seed. Verse 19. Thy seed shall be as the sand, thy offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof, and his name should not have been cut off nor destroyed. They receive the name of God. They become his sons and daughters and their promised seed. This is all teaching us who Jesus is. He's a God that wants families. He wants us to be, multiply and replenish the earth, to follow him and have the land be healthy and come to the temple and recognize who he is. And so there's this whole chapter at the end of first Nephi and it's 22. This is Nephi talking and it's second coming. Nephi kind of gets in this subject of, okay, those of you who live in the latter days need not fear. So there's some wonderful things that come out of first Nephi. For example, chapter 22, look at verse 13. It's not going to end the way you think it's going to end. Good will not defeat evil. Goodness always eat, defeats evil, but in the end, it's not that good will beat evil. It's that, do you see what he saw in verse 13? They're going to destroy each other. Read that, Mike. Yeah, it says, The blood of the great and abominable church, which is the whore of all the earth, shall turn upon their own heads. For they shall war among themselves, and the sword of their own hands shall fall upon their own heads, and they shall be drunken with their own blood. It kind of reminds me of section 45 at the end where the Lord says people are going to be invited to come to Zion because it will be the only people that will not be at war one with another. Right. So it's kind of a different conception of what that the whole end times could be. So hold on to hope, stay with Zion, stay with righteousness because the whole world is going to, they're going to destroy each other. Therefore, one major message, speaking to this group of Gentiles in the latter days, notice what he says, 17, 19, 20, 22. Remember, Nephi was not allowed to tell us what happens. He saw the vision, but he was said, John's going to write it. You're not going to write it, Nephi. You're not going to tell them what happens. So he says, I, I can't tell you what I'm going te- to how it ends, but what I can say is... It's going to be okay. You don't need to worry. I've done this before in classes where I have students grab a pen or a pencil, and they could just put a little check mark next to all the places where the Lord's like, the righteous are going to be okay. The righteous need not fear. It's repeated so often and so many times all the way to the end of verse 28 that it's almost like you'd have to be willfully ignorant to not get the message. And so Nephi's just shouting a message of hope to the righteous Gentiles. Everything's going to be okay. I notice how he says he will preserve the righteous by his power. Righteous need not fear. 19, the righteous shall not perish. 20, the Lord will prepare a way for his people. And 22, the righteous need not fear. So kind of the idea here is gather together as a righteous community, Zion, and let the world fall apart because you're going to be safe in Zion. And yet 
if you think about what Latter-day Saints are doing, we are just bending over backwards to save the world. Yeah, We're do- sending our sons and daughters into the nethermost regions of the earth. We are spending so much treasure and time and sweat to preach Jesus. And so it's not like we're abandoning the world. We're trying to save it. And everybody is invited to bring forth Zion. And I love verse 26, because of the righteousness of his people, Satan has no power, wherefore he cannot be loosed for the space of many years. We just don't make room for him. So let's gather together. Let's be a righteous people. Everything's going to be okay. Satan won't have any control because of the righteousness of the people. What a wonderful society. So I love chapter 22. It's just Nephi just cheering the Latter-day Gentiles on saying, you've got it, guys. You're doing great. Hang in there. Everything's going to be okay. The right Righteous are going to be preserved. We're going to win this battle. Yeah. So just a message of hope. Good. I do like verse uh, 23, where the scriptures point out light and darkness. And look at the four things that, or the five things that the churches of the world, and when we say churches, what do we mean by that? It's just the word it could be assembly. It could be group of people. But they seek, verse 23, to get gain, which is material possessions, power over the flesh, to become popular. They seek the lust of the world and worldly philosophies, things that please the world. And we live in the world today where um, there's definitely this fight going on. And I think the church of Jesus Christ is not going to be so concerned necessarily about being popular or some of these things, but the main message is to teach Christ. And so it's just a really good distinction there between these two movements in First Nephi 22. So Nephi is going to pick up this idea at the latter half of Second Nephi because the latter-day Gentiles are blinded by false truths. He's going to talk about the false churches of the latter days and how to make sure we are not blinded by false truths. So he's going to blow up verse 23 and, you know, 2 Nephi 27, 28, 29, and, you know, at the end of 2 Nephi. So you can kind of see that common theme flowing throughout Nephi's writings. I just want to end with my testimony of a couple of things. There is a God, and he did appear to Joseph, and Joseph didn't write this book. This book's really, really old, and it reflects pre-exilic religion, the religion of a strain of people that believed in God that knew who he was, and Lehi and Nephi are carrying this tradition, teaching and restoring the plain and precious parts to know who Jesus is. What kind of God is this that we worship? And he's a God that is okay with us going through struggle. He wants us to come to him. And as we keep the commandments in the sense of we are standing at watch, we're ready, we're listening. As we listen to those promptings, I really think that's what that means. I don't think it necessarily means a checklist. I know that checklists are easy, but I think what Jesus is saying is, listen to my voice, stay in the river of revelation, and we can bless lives. That's my testimony and my prayer, and with that, we'll see you next week. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe. And if you haven't already, go check out our YouTube channel called Talking Scripture. On that channel, Bryce and I have been working on some new video content. These new videos are in addition to the regular podcasts that Bryce and I do together and supplements to your Come Follow Me study. And we'll leave a link in the description. Once again, thanks for joining us and make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.